Now we are turning to our current story, which is up, which is about a guy that seemingly has it all. More money than you could ever count. Uh, fame, women, mansions, cars, adoration, the works. His name is Sergio Brown. Take a listen to our friends at Crime Online. Myrtle Brown's neighbors speak highly of the longtime Maywood resident. She's described as a lovely lady by Kevin Grayer. Very soft-spoken, outgoing, just a happy person, he says, always on the go. Brown's latest trip is a testament to that, as she had just returned from a group trip to Aruba. And when she returned, she celebrated her 73rd birthday on September 8th. Days later, Myrtle Brown's family is alarmed after not being able to reach her. Sheila Simmons last spoke to her sister six days after Brown's birthday. It was Thursday. Then communication ceased. Two days later, the family searched the Browns' home, coming up empty-handed. The police are called. Myrtle Brown is missing. So this is a 73-year-old mother of NFL star Sergio Brown. Beloved by all, still out and about, active, loving life, gets back from Aruba on a trip with all of her friends, and then suddenly she goes missing just after her birthday. Uh, of course, the alarm is raised. Joining me in all-star panel to make sense of what we know right now about Sergio Brown and his mother, Myrtle Brown, age 73. Um, I want to go straight out to Forrest McFarlane joining us, news reporter, investigative reporter with the U.S. Sun. Let me ask you a question, Forrest McFarland. Um, what do we know about Sergio Brown's upbringing? Where is he from? What do we know about that? Now, Sergio is from Maywood, Illinois. It's a suburb of Chicago. It's not the best place to grow up. Uh, the crime rates are about 90% higher than the rest of the U.S. But from childhood friends who have spoken with us, the U.S. son, we could tell that he seemed to have a good upbringing. Uh, his father was very successful. He was the first black basketball player at Texas A&M. According to his childhood friend, Bridget Howell, his parents would show up for band concerts, for sporting events. Sergio was a great track and field runner. He was a great football player. Uh, so it appears that he had a healthy upbringing and a supportive family. So it seems to me like he had a pretty good upbringing. Dr. Bethany Marshall joining us in addition to Forrest McFarland. Dr. Bethany Marshall, renowned psychoanalyst, joining us out of L.A. You can find her at drbethanymarshall.com. Dr. Bethany, you know, when a child grows up destitute, without love, abused, mistreated, mm -hmm. underprivileged, very often excuses are made for them later in life when they commit a crime. It mm -hmm. is argued that that's how they were brought up. They don't know any different life. And so they continue the life that they know. Right or wrong, that is not an excuse for a felony, especially a violent felony. But it's even more of a conundrum, Dr. Bethany, when the person basically grows up with a silver spoon in their mouth. And then... They act out, if you can call murdering your mother acting out. That's kind of like putting perfume on the pig. But, I mean, the, the dad, Mario Brown, the first African-American men's basketball player at Texas A&M. He was a two-sport star in football and track. Uh, it goes on and on and on now. We, we go to this guy, the son, Sergio Brown. He went to University of Notre Dame. I went to a college meeting the other day about trying to get the twins, you know, where do they want to go to college? The meeting was with Notre Dame. We were all sitting in this big auditorium. You know how much that costs? 80000 dollars a year. Did you hear that? $80,000 mm -hmm. plus a year. That's some school, right? And that's where Sergio Brown went. So he's had mm. all of these wonderful things happening in his life. He's been doted upon. You know, Nancy, what you're describing is a man whose early attachment systems were secure. It's 
it's the attachment systems that create good mental health, um, position the person for life. It, it's not necessarily their education or whether or not they grow up in a crime-ridden neighborhood or how much money the parents have. It's whether or not the parents love the child. And there was plenty of love in this household. Furthermore, Sergio Brown went on to get an MBA in adulthood. Okay, stop, so not only stop, stop, he- stop, stop, stop. What? So he graduated from college and got an MBA, a master's in business? Absolutely, after having great success in the NFL. Good luck, everybody, trying to tell me that he has a insanity or mental defect. Hey, Irv Miller joining me, criminal defense attorney with The Miller Firm. That sounds very important to me, The Miller Firm. Legal analyst, CBS2 Chicago, WBBM-TV, legal technical advisor to The Good Wife and The Good Fight. My goodness, Irv Miller, when do you have time to practice law for Pete's sake? Wait, don't answer that. I want to talk to you about Sergio Brown. It's going to be really hard for him to mount some kind of a, a, a mental defect in this. The man has an well, MBA. Let me tell you. Yes, let me tell you, though, how the mighty have fallen in this particular case. When he went to court yesterday, uh, when he was extradited from uh, Mexico. Oh, you mean uh, after he had a fight with the police on the plane? That? (laughs) After that. Wait till I tell uh, you about that, everybody. I'll tell you what, an air marshal comes up to me and goes, sit down. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I was sitting down yesterday. Why do you have a fight on a plane after 911? That's a good way to get your head bashed in. Go ahead. Right. But guess who was appointed to uh, represent him uh, at the court hearing yesterday? Right, is that serious? You really want me to guess? The public defender of Cook County. Okay. He's broke. Oh. Okay, stop. Stop right there. Stop. Stop. He's broke? He Did... had no money to hire an attorney, so the judge appointed the public defender to represent him. Okay. Okay. I... Hold on. Paul Duffy with me, former Deputy Senior Inspector, U.S. Marshal Service, Senior Consultant with the Group 9 Risk Consultants, and contractor with the U.S. Marshal Service. Does that mean they get you to do things they're not supposed to do? Don't answer that. You have the Fifth Amendment right to marry in silence. Paul Duffy, the man is broke. I mean, how don't, don't NFL players make millions of dollars? Nancy doesn't mean they did squander it away at age... 55, he would be eligible for a retirement from the NFL, minimum of three years playing, but he played for six. And he did put two homes in Colombia on a credit card while he was okay, what, what? vacationing in Mexico. Two homes in Colombia on a credit card? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, you know what? This is getting worse and worse and worse. How you make millions and millions of dollars and you're broke. And you have to have the public defender, who, by the way, are very maligned because public defenders, like prosecutors, are in court trying cases every day. They know the judges. They know the ins and outs. Sure, they don't make a lot of money. They're public defenders. But many of them really know how to try a case. Guys, we are talking about somehow, gee, who did that? Oh, I think it was me. I confess. I've gone off on Sergio Brown having a fight with police on the plane. Uh, And I blame you, Paul Duffy. Uh, Bought two houses on credit cards in Colombia. Had to fire a public, had to hire a public defender because he's now rock bottom broke. What about Myrtle? That's how this whole thing started. His 73 year old mother, Myrtle. Take a listen to our friend Dave Mack. Oh, hold on. Go ahead, Dr. Bethany. Let's just stop everything so you can interrupt. (laughs) Go ahead. Well, if I could jump in about his history, the fact that he had this great upbringing, earned all this money, went to the MBA, you know, had all this great success tells me, like you said so articulately earlier, you know, there's not going to be a mental health defense. But the public should know that this means that this is a highly intent, uh, highly functioning, highly intentional I'm so sorry. Can we start that over? This is a highly functioning, highly inten- uh, intelligent man um, who some, had some intervening factor later in life, um, whether it be drug use. It's not going to be a mental health crisis because you don't function that highly earlier in life and then have a psychotic break. It just doesn't happen. It's, this was either willful 
or some kind of, you know, a manufactured party drug or something, but but it's How not about, because he has uh, a He got mad logical. and killed his mom when she told him what she thought. You ever thought of that, Dr. Bethany? Perhaps. Uh, well, it's interesting that he was living with her, which means he was already in some state of decline if he had all that money earlier in his life. Career earnings, $6,230,959. $6.2 million, average yearly salary, $890,000. Okay, now, Dr. Bethany, can I go forward with our friend Dave Mack? Okay, let's hear what Dave Mack can tell us. Listen. Myrtle Brown isn't the only person missing. Her son, Sergio Brown, isn't answering phone calls or messages from his brother either. Sergio lived with his mother and often took walks in the neighborhood, but according to the family, Sergio's behavior has been off for the past few months. He hadn't really been himself. Days after Myrtle Brown goes missing, Instagram posts of Sergio Brown show up. Reportedly, he's in Mexico. Hours later, Brown posts another Instagram story showing his location as Sydney, Australia. His post is full of characters from the movie Finding Nemo. Police begin looking into their authenticity. Okay, I, I really don't know where to start with that. Um, Dr. Eric Eason, hold on just a moment. Dr. Eric Eason is with us, a board-certified forensic pathologist and consultant. Dr. Eason, hold on. I, I've got to make sense of what I just heard. Forrest McFarland, you're, you're very, very quiet, so I need you to jump in right now. Myrtle Brown was not the only person missing. Son, NFL star Sergio Brown, also seemingly AWOL, uh, but then suddenly, after just a few days after his mother goes missing, Sergio Brown puts Insta Instagram posts up saying he's in Mexico. Then, just a few hours later, he says he's in Sydney, Australia. And then he starts loading up Finding Nemo characters. You do know Finding Nemo is an investigative reporter. You need to know all about that. That's an animated fish. And Dory, who is another animated fish, Finds Nemo. Right, you know about that, Forrest McFarlane. So he claims he's in Mexico. He claims he's in Australia. And he is posting characters from Finding Nemo. Do I have those facts and correct, that, Forrest? You're so right. And that's just the beginning. He makes some wild allegations in these videos posted on Instagram. When he was in Mexico, video surfaced of him partying with other people there. Uh, people what do you at the mean party by partying? Buying, what do you mean by that? I mean, he was, he was buying drinks for people. Um, it's unclear if he was using drugs, but based on the video, he, he was slurring his words. He was stringing together sentences that really didn't make sense. At one point, he said that, the FBI stormed his mother's house and murdered his mom. He said local police have tried to kidnap him. Uh, just, you know, spewing all of these wild allegations that make no sense. And then meanwhile, bystanders who are around Sergio are taking videos of him dancing around and uh, taking shots and having other drinks with people. It really just kind of seemed like he knew the end was coming and was now, just going to... Now, Forrest McFarlane, hold on. You're the investigating news reporter with the U.S. Sun, correct? Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm just a regular news reporter. Are you, or at any time, have you been a criminal investigator and or prosecutor and or defense attorney? Yes, no? No, ma'am. Okay. Would it be beyond the realm of possibility... That he's establishing an alibi and showing that he's in a completely different place than his mom's dead body and he has no idea about it. Is that within the realm of possibility, Forrest McFarland? It for sure is. And based on what prosecutors said in the hearing yesterday, uh, it seems like he bought a one way ticket as as his mother is believed to be killed. So a one-way ticket. The only thing worse is if he used her credit card. Jack, are you telling me he actually used her credit card? That's a yes, no. Just yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. He just made it worse. So Irv Miller, renowned criminal defense attorney from the Miller firm, 
he <laughs> goes missing immediately after his mother is killed. He turns up in uh, one location in Mexico, partying, as Forrest McFarlane has described, then suggests he's in Sydney, Australia, which is, what, a 15, 18-hour flight, then begins posting characters from Finding Nemo. Uh, Irv, I want you to hear a little bit of the Instagram rant to which Forrest McFarlane is referring. Let's just hear the first seven seconds. Hit it. FBI, they came into my house on Bob Marley's death day with a 511 agent gas unwarranted. Okay, the FBI came into my house on Bob Marley death day. Uh, it's kind of hard to understand because as Forrest McFarlane told us, there's a lot of partying going on in the background. You hear music. We tried to mute it for you. Okay, let's hear some more. They kidnapped me twice from home, the Maywood Police Department, right? Aaron Pepper was there the second time that it happened. They kidnapped me twice from home. The FBI, is he saying, Forrest McFarlane, the FBI and, or the Maywood Police kidnapped him? Is, did, is, that, is that what I'm hearing? You're hearing right. Okay, let's hear some more because he's about to put his foot right in it. Listen. It had to be the FBI or the Maywood police. I thought my mama was on vacation in Sinaloa. Okay, he thinks his mother was on vacation in Sinaloa. Okay. Uh, Nancy, if I could jump in about this really could quickly. I, stop I don't you? think Go this ahead. is <laughs> I don't think this is creating an alibi. When people are psychotic, drinking, using uh, manufactured drugs, um, in the midst of the psychosis, there can be an interweaving of confessional, childlike lying, and bits and pieces of the truth. For instance, he knows at some point he will be arrested and incarcerated, held against his will. So that comes as, oh, the, the, the police and the uh, FBI came in and they kidnapped me twice. Mm -hmm. That's the ramblings of a man who knows he's in big, big trouble. I don't know, Dr. Bethany. You're giving him a lot of credit. I think he's trying <laughs> to see why a um, technical legal term. Let's hear some more. That's fake news. Get the out of my face. Every time. You want to come to me? The Maywood police got to give me money. Fake news? Is he actually talking about fake news and trying to say his mother is not dead, but she's in Sinaloa? Uh, okay, let's hear let's hear a little bit more. FBI had to do it. They got the power to do some like that. What the is going on? That's fake news. Don't come with me. So he's actually blaming law enforcement for the death of his mother, which actually we haven't even gotten to the death of Miss Myrtle. Listen. Brown's family went back to search the family property a second time. Neighbors joined the search, and Myrtle Brown's body is found alongside a creek near the home, approximately 100 to 150 feet away from her back door. Her body was wrapped in a sheet. The medical examiner ruled Myrtle's death a homicide, citing multiple assault-related injuries, blunt force trauma. Okay, the fact that her body is wrapped up in a sheet shows what we call staging. In my experience, and everybody on the panel, jump in if you think differently. A random killer does not stick around, hang around the dead body long enough to stage anything. Say you break in a home, you're right in the middle of stealing something, and in walks the little old lady who owns the home, you panic and kill her. You get out of there as fast as you can. You don't wait to hide her body and wrap it in a sheet and stage it to make it look like a suicide or something. No, you get the hay out of there. Joining me right now, Dr. Eric Issa, joining us out of South Carolina, board-certified forensic pathologist and consultant. Dr. Eason, thank you for being with us. What does this mean? Multiple assault-related injuries, blunt force trauma. They took one look at her and said, this is not a heart attack. It's not a stroke. It's not a suicide. This is blunt force trauma. She was murdered. Right. So blunt force trauma is an injury due to a solid object striking the body or the body hits the solid object or some combination of the two. Uh, you're going to result in uh, having injuries on the body that are uh, bruises, scratches, uh, lacerations, which are tears on the skin. Uh, internally, you're going to find fractures and uh 
usually some internal bleeding or hemorrhage. Um, my guess is that most of the injuries are probably to the head is what I'm thinking here. And Nancy, if I can jump in for one second, Nancy, the, the uh, complaint that uh, was presented in court basically said that the cause of death, one of the uh, uh, areas of injury, she had a broken neck. Um, in addition to that, when you said she was found with a sheet covering her, uh, she was found nude underneath that sheet. And there was video of him burning uh, some objects in a fire pit shortly thereafter, which later determined to be clothing. My guess is he did that because uh, his blood was on her clothing and he had the sense to try to get rid of that evidence by burning it. And uh, so that adds a little uh, insight into what was going through his mind at the time that this happened. He also stole her phone, her credit cards, and they were found on him at the time of his arrest in Mexico. And Nancy, if I could, going back to the sheet, wrapping the body in the sheet, as you all know, could show reverence or even love, to wrap the body and hide the body. Is that Dr. Aston or Forrest McFarland? That was Paul Duffy at the end. Paul Duffy, will you say that one more time? Because I want to follow up on everything sure. Irv said and what you just said. Would you repeat that one more time? You were a little fuzzy. Sure. Uh, Nancy, as you well know, uh, wrapping that body in a sheet could be a, a sign of reverence or a sign of love, not wanting to leave the body out to the elements and out naked. Oh, okay, Paul Duffy. Like when we find a baby that's been killed and someone has wrapped it in its favorite blanket. Is that the, exactly. the analogy is correct? Okay, so that means it's someone close to them. I'm not buying the love and the reverence. Well, man, I don't know. It's very complicated. Look, I'm a JD, not a shrink like Dr. Bethany. But even if you did love the person at one point you still murder mm -hmm. them but you're right it's a clue a very a very important clue paul duffy because we only see that when the killer is connected to the victim in some close way like when tot mom murdered her daughter keely keely was uh, in a plastic bag thrown in a swamp true but also with one of her favorite blankets i see what you're saying it points to who the killer is. And Irv Miller, um, tell me again what you were saying. Her body was naked. Hey, Irv, listen to this. Our friends in Cut 3, Dave Mack. Myrtle Brown's neighbor, Carlos Cortez, said he saw Myrtle and Sergio together on Thursday. That's the same day Myrtle talked with her sister. Then police found footage on the Ring doorbell camera. Sergio was seen taking out the trash and lighting a bonfire. Is that the video you're talking about, Irv Miller? Uh, you know, I, I wasn't able to hear it. Could, could you it's play a that ring. One more time? It's doorbell ring camera video. I love those things. Um, the ring doorbell camera catches Sergio Brown taking out trash and lighting a bonfire, but he didn't do a very good job. Um, it, it reminds me of Stephen Avery who uh, of making a murder of fame, who murdered Teresa Hallback, and he stirred a fire pit all night long, according to his blood relatives and neighbors. And in it were the studs off the back of her Daisy Fuentes blue jeans, off Teresa Hallback's blue jeans, and little bits, tiny little bits of bone, maybe teeth. Same thing. You have to basically incinerate objects to get rid of them. So Irv Miller, you're telling me that when they go back to the fire pit, they find out that Miss Myrtle's clothes were what was being burned. Yes, exactly. Oh yeah, he's going to hell. Short pit stop with a life behind bars conviction. So, okay, to Forrest McFarland joining us, investigative reporter with The Sun, what can you tell me, Forrest, about this fire pit and the ring camera footage? Yeah, no, like it's already been said, there definitely was fabric that was obtained from the crime scene. Uh, so no matter what his efforts were to uh, potentially hide uh, the murder, if he is convicted of the killing, um, they were not effective. Uh, and they were able to find other evidence uh, from the crime scene, which um, proved it was a homicide. Also in the bathroom, they found Ajax, 
uh, a cleaning agent, and it appeared that the bathtub had just been scrubbed. So that was another piece of evidence that was revealed Hold in court. Hold on, Forrest McFarland. That, you know what? You really are a font of information, and it's all correct. So, Dr. Eric Easton, I'm going to circle back to the Ajax and why people turn into neatnik, neatniks after someone goes missing like their wife or their mother. And then they suddenly have the compulsion to clean the whole bathroom with Ajax. Dr. Eric Easton, board-certified forensic pathologist, what evidence do you believe they may have found on the body to suggest it was murder or within the home? If she was bludgeoned, I don't do you really think she was bludgeoned there, outdoors? Or is that a secondary crime scene where her body was disposed? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, the thing that they're going to look for at the autopsy is uh, the thing I would do is I would definitely take the uh, fingernail clippings and uh, look for possible uh, blood or DNA under there from the uh, assailant and try and match it with the uh, with the defendant. That's what I would do. Um, as far and as the other and evidence... that's exactly what happened in this case, actually. Okay, good. <laughs> good. Yeah, that's and exactly it was a match. Be, there was blood underneath her fingernail, and that, uh, the Maywood police were able to uh, send it to the Illinois State Police Crime Lab, and there was a match between uh, the blood underneath the fingernails and the DNA that they found uh, on his toothbrush in uh, in the house. Don't you just love, well, doctor, love it when they get your toothbrush, Irv Miller? So, Dr. Eric Eason, how do you, I mean, you perform literally thousands of um, exams. How do you process a little old lady body to determine who is the killer? Could you please start with how the hands are bagged with paper bags at the crime scene? Yes. So uh, the police arrived and the uh, crime scene investigators arrived. They will uh, immediately place paper bags over the hands. Uh, they will then uh, take the body and uh, not disturb it very much and then deliver it to the morgue. Uh, when the body arrives to the morgue, uh, pictures are taken immediately going to full body x-rays and then the autopsy begins. And then the first part is to remove the clothing. And when the clothing is removed, you look at the clothing too. And so you could actually find uh, hair on on the clothing so if any of the hair from the defendant ended up on the clothing that can be collected you could also collect trace evidence from the clothing the clothing is then uh placed in the bags and submitted to a crime lab and then uh when the paper bags are removed from the hands you take uh, nail clippers and uh, clip the uh, the fingernails and uh, place those in separate bags uh, bag for the right hand bag for the left hand that uh, then gets submitted to the crime lab as well uh then the autopsy begins and you'll do the external exam and uh describe all the injuries that you see on the body. You measure them and describe them and photograph them. Uh, the internal exam then occurs when you match the injuries on the outside of the body with what was found on the inside. And then if you can, at the end of the internal exam, you will then establish a uh, cause of death and a manner of death, which is what uh, happened here. I also know, and jump in, Paul Duffy, Irv Miller, Dr. Bethany, um, and Forrest McFarland, of course. We know that there was blood on the back patio of Miss Myrtle's home. We know Ajax was in the bathtub drain, possibly indi indicative of it being recently cleaned. We know that Miss Myrtle, who is Myrtle Brown, Sergio Brown's mother, her iPad, credit cards, and phones missing, her cigarettes left behind. Uh, as you heard, he booked a one-way ticket to Cancun, flying out in the early morning hours of September 15. And I, I, I'm trying to determine exactly when her murder occurred. And then there are his odd posts claiming everything uh, 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 about his mom's death is all, quote, fake news. It has to be the FBI claiming he thought his mother was on vacation, even though he spotted with her around the home and um, getting rid of and burning her clothes in the yard. Irv Miller, what more can you tell me? Well, uh, he, he was trying to reach out for any type of uh, uh, potential defense that he could possibly come up with and trying to figure out everything from the alibi to blaming the FBI to blaming the uh, the police to say he was being kidnapped on the airplane, uh, just reaching out for every possible uh, straw that he could come up with. Unfortunately, uh, uh, that doesn't do a defense lawyer much good in court trying to figure out which one of those to go with. Um, perhaps uh, 
um, there is no good one to go with. And you just uh, rely upon the state to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt, period. What can you tell me, Forrest McFarland, uh, investigative reporter with the U.S. Sun, about a fight on the plane? Yeah, so another wild video surfaced of Sergio after he was taken in by police. He had another violent outburst on the plane and was just screaming, uh, claiming that he was being taken to Tijuana, Mexico against his will, uh, that he was being kidnapped when in reality he was being arrested um, and taken back to Illinois to answer for his alleged crimes uh, and be investigated for the death of his mother. I also think it's important to note, uh, just circling back to his mom's death and the blunt trauma uh, death, I think it's interesting to note his career in the NFL. At one point, Sergio, who stands at 6'2", was 210 pounds of pure muscle. He played as the safety, which is basically like the human shield, the last result resort for the defense. Uh, it was his job to stop the ball at all costs um, from crossing his team. One of his most notable moments in the NFL was tackling Rob Gronkowski, uh, the famous NFL quarterback, and breaking his arm after tackling him. I mean, one violent outburst against your 73-year-old mother is more than enough, I think, to kill her. Can we get back to Nancy, the Gronk Gronk jump in about this. arm? Hold on, hold on. Tell me about Gronkowski's arm, because you know what I'm thinking about, uh, Forrest McFarlane? I'm thinking about Miss Myrtle's neck and how her little neck was just snapped. Tell me about Ron, Ron Gronkowski's arm again. Now, Sergio Brown and Rob Gronkowski had a famous rivalry. Uh, during his career in the NFL. They were once teammates and then became rivals after Sergio violently tackled him on the field, broke his arm. He was out for who knows how many games, recovering from this injury. And uh, on the following season, Rob Gronkowski says that Sergio Brown was just goading him, talking smack across the field, and eventually he just had it, grabbed Sergio Brown and threw him off of the field um, in a, an iconic moment uh, in NFL history. So this man was powerful. He could get in people's heads. Um, he you know, was just playing a game that he did for his job, and he was able to snap an incredibly healthy and strong man's heart. Is it true, Forrest McFarland, investigative reporter, U.S. Sun, that Sergio Brown's mother neck was snapped? Yes, ma'am, it's true. And it's believed that uh, she died from blunt force trauma. So that could have been you know, an object was used to hit her, maybe a fist. Um, I mean, at 73 years old, and she was quite a slight woman as well. She was very thin uh, and small. So, you know, one stray hit, I could have snapped her neck. Paul Duffy joining us, uh, former Deputy Senior Inspector, U.S. Marshals, now Consultant Group 9 Risk Consultants. You have hunted down felons, usually killers, drug lords, all over the world as a U.S. Marshal. Why is it a big, huge guy like Sergio Brown, as Forrest told us, six foot two, 210 pounds of nothing but muscle, would attack someone so weak and so defenseless like his own 73-year-old mother? And of course, he's pled not guilty, and he has not been convicted in a court of law. Why is that, Paul? You've looked at defendants all around the world. Nancy, it would be difficult to come up with a motive, but I would consider, and I would be surprised if the defense didn't look into concussions he might have sustained in the Thank NFL in leading to coming. a violent effort. Okay, so a concussion. Okay. Paul Duffy, as much as that, um, I feel like I'm eating a dirt sandwich when you said that. You're probably right. That's probably where they're going to go. 
Irv Miller, uh, have you noticed, as Dr. Bethany was saying earlier, very often you see defendants weave a tiny bit of truth into their big fat lie? And I, I believe we're seeing that here. But, you know, my mom is going to be 92 in December. She lives with us. And I still see her as young and vibrant. But every once in a while, I see her as she really is. She's frail. She's kind of bent over. She's a shadow of herself. Just so beautiful with black hair and blue eyes and endless amounts of energy. And I'm just thinking of Miss Myrtle Brown up against a, a, an NFL safety. Really? As for you, Irv. Um, I, I, see, I see an issue here uh, as a former prosecutor because, you know, we always look for motive even though we don't have to prove motive. What he took from her not only was her credit cards, her phone, her iPad, but also her bank cards. I think this was a garden variety robbery that went bad. He wanted money. He needed assets. He needed credit cards. Uh, who? Uh, that is what was going on and precipitated uh, a fight uh, between his mother and himself. And it went too far. He ended up killing her, allegedly. And uh, when he was, as I said before, when he was arrested in Mexico, guess what he had on his person? Her iPad, her phone, her credit cards, and her bank cards. To me, that says it all. Dr. I, I Bethany, disagree. Oh, uh, I, I totally disagree with that. I'm sure you're that. going to give him so, some deep psychological motive, and I honestly can't I, wait to hear it. Okay, i got to get comfortable for this. Huh? Go ahead. I do have professional athletes and, and former pro athletes in my practice, and often they get addicted to a combination of painkillers, opiates, um, steroids, and and a stimulant like methamphetamine. And they use them all together for multiple reasons to hold on to their energy, their youth, mostly to bulk up and to feel like the former athlete they once were, the opiates to cover all the pain um, that they're suffering after having played for so many years. And this, this turns into a lethal combination for somebody who's already sociopathic in terms of his character. So you have multiple factors at work. I think his mother probably just said no to something small, finally had it, set a limit. He went into a roid rage uh, on stimulants. We know with meth, they don't just kill, it's overkill. After he killed her, he panicked. He wrapped the body not out of love and reverence. He wrapped it out of disgust. This is why mothers wrap their babies before they throw them in the trash or, you know, Casey Anthony, you know, put, put her daughter like in wasn't it garbage bags it's because they can't bear to look at what they've done he didn't want to see the naked body of his mother with her neck snapped and blood all over the place it's kind of like a teenager when they throw away their you know half-eaten hamburger they, they usually stuff it in a bag before they put it in the trash it's disgust that's all it is why did he take her her iPad and, and bank cards, it's because he had sunk so low, he probably didn't even have three cents in his own wallet to get to Mexico. I don't think it was thought out at all. I don't think it was a robbery. I don't think the, de the death was staged. I think he was out of his mind on drugs. Okay, and he's a so sociopath Dr. and Bethany, he was loose. Of course, I never have a favorite guest. There's no such thing because they're all so special to me, but right now you're running number two, because I'm going with Irv Miller on this, okay? Not to say he's my favorite, but Dr. Bethany, this is a yes-no question. I accept. <laughs> yes-no question, Dr. Bethany. Do you have a blood test? Do you have uh, a breathalyzer? Do you even have any scintilla of evidence to suggest at the time Miss Myrtle was murdered that her son, Sergio Brown, the NFL star, was using meth or steroids? Any written evidence? Yes, no. Behavioral evidence based so upon then, looking no. at the Instagram post. You're, you're, you're <laughs> no. guessing. Okay. That said, we wait as justice unfolds. Good luck with that public defender, Sergio. Goodbye, friend. Guys, thank you for watching Crime Online with Nancy Grace here on YouTube. To get the very latest, subscribe to Crime Online here.